Um, it's great to see you all here today and to trust that you've had a blessed week and uh, our singing was lovely this morning, wasn't it? And uh, Takai, thank you for leading us in prayer today and uh, you know, God is with us even through our difficult times and our darkest times and in the most challenging times. And I hope that as we journey through life, that we're able to take him through those most difficult times, as I know Harpy and Vivi are, and Janelle and your brother. It's tough, isn't it? It's tough. Anyway, we're going to open up God's Word today. We're going to continue down the narrow road. Our theme that we have been following is walking down the, the narrow road. And as we journey down that road, what is most critical for all of us is that we stay on that narrow road. And it's how we walk that narrow path that is most critical. And some of those themes that we've been sort of looking at is um, broken, the cost, authenticity, the shrines of the heart. And uh, today, we're going to be looking at um, aspect of knowing what we believe, but also the aspect of maturing of our faith. Now, I have to give you a wee bit of a warning. No one will be harmed in this process, but there might be a, a couple of things that you might sort of think, well, these are well-warned themes. And I want you to resist those thoughts because when we have, you know, like some of the stories in scripture are often very familiar to us. And because they are familiar, they can lose their impact. So as your mind may wander during what we're saying and go, hmm, it's a well-worn theme, resist that thought. All right. Anyway. But let, let, let us continue, and uh, I always have enjoyed the idea of running. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. But anyway, and for those of you who do enjoy running, here is a race that I, Louis, you might be interested in this one. You will thoroughly enjoy this one, and this one is the the Marathon de Sable that's run in the part of Morocco. And uh, it's a five day run and it's about 270 kilometers. And as you can see, there are many people who wish to run in the back blocks of Morocco through the desert of the Sahara. Now temperatures do get up to around about 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 48 degrees or 50 degrees Celsius. There they all are, running their hearts content up and down the sand dunes. And they are not supported. You have to do this independently. Now that's fun. Downhill, that's all right. I don't mind that. Downhill, that's all good. Getting up there is a problem. And each night over the five nights, you camp now, in, in the tents, and the good news is that these tents are Berber tents made out of goats here. So that is good news, isn't it? That's terrific. Uh, label tents, and uh, nice and breezy for you. Five days, 270 odd kilometers, unsupported. Yes, people have died on these runs, not surprisingly, you know. Uh, 221, one person died, fainted, never recovered, and uh, last year someone also died. But the satisfaction is about winning. If you do come first, you only get 34,000 euros. You sort of go, gee, all that for that. I mean, it's not, not a bad payday, but only one person gets it. And as you can see, you, mate, you've got to be pretty fit on that one. Anyway, but it's how you run the race. And... Um, this, this gentleman here, um, Abel Mutai, who was the leader, who thought that he got to the finish line. 
He thought he got it to the finish line, but the, the person behind him, Fernandez Anaya, who's a Spaniard, this was run in a tin pot little town in, in, um, in Spain, and uh, a cross country race, and he thought he got to the finish line, and Fernandez behind him and says, encourages him to keep going, keep going. But what should a competitor do? He should pass him, shouldn't he? And his coach said, he did the wrong thing. He, he did something that I wouldn't do myself. Yes, on the other hand, he did the right thing and sort of saying, hey, you know, keep going, keep going. But as Fernandez, Ivan Fernandez um, said, it wasn't right for me to win. I didn't deserve to win. So he just encouraged him to, to carry on. Great sportsmanship. And his coach said to him, if you did that in the competitive race that you were going for the Olympics, you would have lost your spot on the team. Does he regret it? Not in the least. Now, some people are really quite creative in the way that they wish to finish the race. And uh, Shania Miller, she was very keen to win. And uh, um, uh, Alison Felix, she's the lady who's standing up, thought that she may have won her fifth gold at the Olympics. But Shania Miller from the Barbados was desperate to win. But did she win? Oh, mate, she's pretty close. Pretty close. But what's the criteria for winning? The head and the torso. The head and the torso. Here she is. She's keen, isn't she? That's a terrific shot, isn't it? Terrific shot. She's keen. Well, that's how it was on the, over the finish line. And because she got her, what was the criteria again? The torso, head and torso over the line. She won. Is it legal to dive? Yep. Yep. I didn't think it was. I thought you had to be on your legs. But anyway, she wasn't. She won fair and square. But there were a few, oh, I shouldn't have been a dive. <coughs> but anyway, she, she won. Now, another person, uh, Michael um, Mutanga from Kenya, as many great runners are from Ethiopia and Mutanga, um, uh, and Kenya. He was running the uh, Hanover Marathon, and uh, the second spot was up for grabs. And as you look at him, he's well in front, has he not? He's got it in the bag, has he not? Not quite. This is how he finished the race. His legs, 10 metres before, gave up, and he started to crawl over the line, and he crawled over with 0.03 seconds to spare before number three took over. He only won 4,000 euros for his trouble. He did it in two hours, 10 minutes. Mate, 42K in two hours, 10 minutes, isn't that amazing? Now, mate, you're doing um, three and a half minute kilometers, and you've got to be super fit to be able to do that. But he was terribly keen to get over that finish line, and that's what it is about, you know, races like these. It's, you know, it's about finishing. And there are a number of these races where people, I will do this even if I have to crawl. And uh, some, some amazing people. But Catherine Schweitzer was the first female competitor in the Boston Marathon. And she snuck into the marathon because she put her initials in and so she became undetected. And, you know, when everyone saw her dressed up on a drizzly day, Nobody noticed there was a female in the race. But the organiser of the race became incensed, and this is the man behind her. He was incensed that she was running in this race, and he grabbed her. And he wanted to grab her to take her out of the race. Well, anyway, it got a little bit more exciting. That's her boyfriend there, came in and rescued her and pushed her out of, out of the way. 
And uh, so there was that sort of scuffle there. How dare a female run in the 1967 Boston Marathon? And uh, that's her security team, security. And uh, she managed to complete her race. She reflected afterwards and she said this, I'm gonna finish this race on my hands and knees if I have to. And she, be, she fought for females to um, compete in the Boston Marathon, it was in the, I think it was about 1972, that they finally allowed the ladies to compete in the, in the marathon. I thought it was a done, done dinner. Um, I, I thought they were all allowed to compete. So that, that was a surprise to me. Now, here's a couple of embarrassing moments when it comes to racing. And um, Perry Goy, who was running the race, thought he had it in the bag. And how do we press play? Do I press play? Here he is. Look at him. Yes. Yes. Pump it on the crowd. Oh. 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 You know, when, when you're before the finishing line and you're going like this, yeah, I won, I won. Oh, oh. How embarrassing. That, he'll never do that again. He'll never do that again. Now, first prize goes to a New Zealand lady, Sylvia Potts. She completed in the Mexico, Mexican Olympics in 68, and then she, um, in, in, in a few races, got to the finals, um, but didn't win any medals. But she was to compete in, she competed in the 70, 1970 Edinburgh uh, Commonwealth Games. And she got into the finals for the 800 metres. And there were high hopes. And she had high hopes too. Here she is. Sylvia Potts. In the Commonwealth Games. Here she is. On the outside there. There's the finish line. Wouldn't that break your heart? Two metres before the finish line. That would break your heart, wouldn't it? And, you know, her husband coached her. Uh, and, you know, she was pretty philosophical over that race. You know, you couldn't let it consume you. But to be so close to that gold medal, it would just, it'd always be in the back of your mind, wouldn't it? You know, if, if only. If only my legs just didn't give out, you know. And, and for many marathon runners, you know, Michael um, um, Mutunga, his legs simply just gave out at, at the, you know, toward the end of the race. And he couldn't run. And so he had to sort of crawl over. There was another lady, who I didn't show you the clip of, she was like a drunken sailor before the finish line. And she was flying around in all sorts of different directions trying to get to the finish line. And, uh, but for Sylvia Potts to fall short is a tragedy, is it not? Do you know what the greatest tragedy is? Falling short on the finish line of salvation. Today I'm going to talk about almost saved. Almost saved. Now, for many people, when they sit in church, they think we're all okay. But the most tragic place to be in, I believe, is in the category of almost saved. Now, you'll be sitting there and you think, there is no such biblical category as almost saved. But for a lot of people, they are pretty close to the finish line, but they're just not quite there. <coughs> and it'll be awful when the resurrection comes, the thousand years after the resurrection, 
and good Adventists are getting up out of the grave. <sighs> Where's the gates? Walking up there, see St. Peter there at the gate. <laughs> Sorry, mate, you're a thousand years late. But, 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 I was almost there. That is the greatest tragedy, is it not? And whatever we do, whatever we think, Paul tells us that we need to run that race and complete that race. It's not about being first, and I understand that this is one of those well-worn themes of running that race, but it nonetheless, it still applies. And as we walk along the narrow path, there is something that we need to guide us. And that is scripture. And I know you know that. And as you sit here, we are going to go over some quite familiar scriptures. But I just, there's going to be something afterwards that I want to share with you that many find challenging. I'll tell you why in a minute. So anyway, let's have a look at these scriptures that's coming up here. So I want you to bring out your Bibles and let's have a, a look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's have a look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. And it's, it's, he, he says here, let's read verse 22 as well. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through what? The living and... Mine says abiding word of God. So, Peter says here, and I'll read this passage again, since you have been born again, we've all been born again, have we not? Do I have an amen? Absolutely. And not of imperishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. And so as we sit here, yes, we are born again because we believe in Jesus Christ. And through the spirit of God, he regenerates. But it is also through scripture as well, the abiding word of God very critical in our journey. Let's have a look at our next passage. John chapter 17. And, and for us as Seventh-day Adventists, we are familiar with this passage. And Jesus is, is, is talking here. And he says, just simply and succinctly, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Foundational scripture for the people of God walking on the narrow path. Because the word of God changes people's lives. It sanctifies. What does sanctification mean? Mean. What does sanctification mean? It simply means that as we walk with God, he changes our lives, changes our hearts, and it happens through the word of God. As we connect with it. All right. As we connect with it. Now, here's one in Psalms chapter 119.
Psalms chapter 119, and let's have a look at verse 9. Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your... So, again, as we walk along this narrow path, what guides us, what sanctifies us, what changes our lives, what keeps us on that narrow path? It is the Word. I'll come to the but in a minute. Be patient. Be patient. All right. Now, we'll also look at verse 130. Let's have a look at verse 130. And... Um, says here, the unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the... Yeah, it's not quite a good word in these days, is it? But, you know, what he is saying that... The psalmist is saying that he, everybody can understand the plan of salvation. The, the word is, is a guide... As the unfolding of the words, it gives light to the soul. It gives us light to our path. In fact, he says here, back in the verse 105, what we know very well, your word is the lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word is a light. So, as we walk along the path, God gives us light. He shines the path. And it doesn't matter whether you're the brightest person here or not the brightest person here. We all can understand the plan of salvation, but as we walk along that path, we must use this as a guide. Okay? All right. Hebrews 4 verse 12. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. And he says here, For the word of God is a living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul of the spirit of the joints of the marrow. And, you know, the, the Bible has that power through God's spirit it has the ability to be able to convict people of sin, to convict people of doing the right or the wrong thing, to lead them, to guide them. And for the word of God is a living and active and a sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul. It gets to the heart. One of the challenges that we have is that when you're doing something like a doctrine or a teaching, you know what a lot of Adventists do? When it comes to reading the Bible, you know what often happens? It's hard yakka. It's boring. And do you know, over the years, I've heard a lot of Adventists say, I get sick and tired of doctrine being rammed down my throat. Don't worry, brother or sister, you're almost saved. <laughs> oh, sorry, I shouldn't know. Anyway. anyway, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. All right. And, and, and I get that, you know, I've been an Adventist, you know, for most of my life now. And I understand that, and I hear that. But the challenge is, is to help to make this still relevant and real as we walk on the path. And we have to do that. And even when we say to God, God, look, I'm really struggling with your scripture today. My mind's in... 50 miles away, 100 miles away, things swirling around in the head. 
that this is why we need to try and keep our teachings and to keep scripture fresh. I'll talk more about that after one o'clock. All right. Okay. All right. Second Timothy chapter two. And we'll look at verse 15. And he says, do, you, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. This is perhaps one of the more challenging aspects of Scripture in our life. Rightly handling the truth. Now, how does that happen? Ah, but my favourite speaker says this. Mr YouTube says that. And people tend to go by the the word of their favourite person that they listen to. And I want to say to you that, you know, this is how I came into the church and I, I thank, you know, Steve Currow and Bob Larson and, and all these different people that, you know, sort of persevered with me because I was hard yakker and I gave them a hard time. But... One of the things that was drummed into me that I had to know what we believed. Because when I came out of the Pentecostal church and when I asked my mate, you know, is speaking in tongues of the devil, he looked at me and he said, because um, he was an Adventist, and, you know, because I was really excited about speaking in tongues, I was over the moon. And I thought, he would be over the moon too. And when I asked him and I, and I said to him, there's something wrong about tongues because he didn't look enthusiastic. And he said, mm, well, you know, he envied the art. And he did a bit of a Tony Abbott before the, before the camera in the art and, and sort of was stammering a fair bit. And then I asked him, I said, mate, do you believe that tongues is of the devil? And we looked at the ground, like, yeah, oh, um, I'll get back to you. Next day, I go up to his desk, and um, this was in the days of when I worked in the post office. Went up to his desk and said, do you believe that this is, you know, um, of the devil? And he said, yes. So what's Mark to do then? Ah, I know. Let me consult YouTube. Let me consult the newspaper. What's Mark to do? Mark had to follow what Scripture said. Uh, I'm not trying to sort of... I'm just telling you a little bit how I arrived at where I arrived. I had to consult scripture, and this is where the local pastors and my mate, Bernard, helped me through that. And so I had to learn what our church taught. And yes, it was the old style of fill in the blanks. Yep, I know. And I had to do them about two or three times because I didn't get it first time round. But I had to learn what we believed. Yes, it was doctrine can be dry, but it was helpful in the sense that it gave a scaffolding for what I, uh, for, for not only the Adventism but also for the Christian, my Christian faith. It gave me a scaffolding. But then I had to learn the heart stuff, and that sort of you know that was much much slower. Le learning to connect through the word. The, you know, the, the word is sharper than a two-edged sword. Walking along this narrow path, Mark had to 
uh, either follow what Scripture said or say, as many people in the church, the Pentecostal church that I was a part of would say, ah, but the Spirit lead me here. The Spirit has not told me to keep the Sabbath. The Spirit has not told me about that the second coming that we meet Jesus in the air. The Spirit has told me that Jesus will set up a kingdom on earth for, for a thousand years of peace. Oh, oh, okay. So Daniel 2 is a little bit different to what they taught. Daniel 9 is a little bit different to what they taught. So what am I to do? Am I to follow what Scripture says? Or shall I, ah, oh, the Spirit says this. Or the Spirit says that. And that's how it was in that church. And so while these passages of Scripture are familiar, I share them with you that as we walk along the narrow path, we need this to guide and to lead us. Now, imagine a world with no Bible. Imagine. It's not too hard. It's not too hard. Now, let me take to you back, back, back into history. Here's old John Wycliffe. You know, he, he, he lived between 1330 and 1384. He, he was a, a scholar. He's one of these people with a giant brain, huge brain on him. He, he was an Englishman, and uh, he was taught in all the schools and all the various disciplines. But as he looked around at what was going on in the Christian church of the time, he was appalled. He was appalled. Pope Urban V had demanded that England submit to Rome. And what that meant was that it would have to give up all its sovereignty as the United Kingdom, it wasn't known as the United Kingdom then, the United Kingdom give up all its sovereignty to Rome. Let us think about that for a moment. <laughs> uh, no. Now, what was going on back then was that they would ship gold off to Rome. Do you know, get this, they shipped five times as much gold to Rome than the king got. And the king would go, is that all I get? <laughs> Something wrong here. But more than that, the local friars were keeping the people poor because they would say, you can purchase the forgiveness of sins in advance, past, present, but just give us a bit of... If you confess your sins to me, I can give you absolution. If you pay a little bit more money, I can help get your relative out of purgatory. And so you had all these various teachings there that had enslaved people. The common people did not have the Bible. And in fact, even the friars themselves didn't have access to the Bible. Do you know that uh, it was not uncommon to study, if you were to become a theologian, to study eight to ten years before you could even look at a Bible? How on earth could you study for eight to ten years and before you could even look at a Bible? Imagine a world without the Bible. There's incredible darkness, no plan of salvation. There is not the truth of the salvation by grace. It was salvation by works. Oh, yeah, look, there's a bit of grace thrown in there, but it was by works. And so there was no light here. So along comes Wycliffe, who puts out these tracts 
to expose the um, false teachings of the, the friars, to also expose the, um, their practices and the ways in which they were enslaving themselves. He said that they were lazy and all this sort of thing. And so there were a few trials of Wycliffe you know, to charge him with heresy in order to keep them in line with the established teaching of the Christian church. Well, Wycliffe fell ill. And like little ants, the friars come around him and wanted him to recant. And they begged him, we can forgive you for all your false teachings. Come on recant because they thought he was going to die you know what he said i shall not die but live and again declare the evil deeds of the friars as he sort of whoosh, out of the bed and they scurried out of the room you know what he did then he started to translate the bible into english and so back in that time he translated the Bible into English and, <clears throat> and so for the people to be able to have a hint of scripture. He was known as the morning star of the Reformation. And, uh, and Wycliffe in his third trial, and this was after he had translated the Bible, he said this, With whom do you think you are contending? With an old man on the brink of a grave? No, with truth, truth which is stronger than you and will overcome you. But where does that truth come from? Oh, I think, I think, I think. Is it about what you think? But I think this, but I think that. I think it is this. Or was it Pastor So and So on my favourite channel? Truth. We must rediscover that sense of what truth is. Truth is not just that dry doctrinal beliefs. And I know that our church has struggled in teaching that over the years. But we've got to find a way of making it come alive. Ask God to help make these truths come alive. And John Wycliffe, as the morning star of the Reformation, had a huge influence on John Huss, who had read um, John Wycliffe's teaching, who, that inspired him to teach the teachings of John Wycliffe at his chapel in Bethlehem, not in Bethlehem, but at Bethlehem Church in um, Czechoslovakia, in, 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 the Czech, in Prague. And it inspired him to do that. And when John Huss was burned to the stake for believing in Scripture, odd, isn't it? Crazy. And then you had the people like the, the Coventry martyrs the commentary martyrs between 1512 and, and around about 1520 around about that time there was 12 or 13 the numbers are disputed who were a part of a church who were martyred for their faith and there was a lady who whose name was mistress smith and she was about to be released but then they saw a little bit of a paper in her sleeve that had the Papal Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments up her sleeve. You know what they did? They arrested her, and she was immediately burned at the stake for that. For that. For having the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments. Such was the determination of the established church to keep Scripture out of the hands of the people. 
And you have people like that, and it inspires me personally, you have people like that and many, many other thousands of people who were willing to give their life just to have a little bit of scripture. Just that little bit of light. So precious that it was to those people at that time. And you have to ask yourself, why? Because truth was precious. Now I want to just take you just to a couple of places in Acts 26. Now this was when Paul was on trial for his faith. Now you know Paul that he was not backward and coming forward, was he? And so he was um, before um, Festus, Felix, and now he is before Herod Agrippa. And I just want to unfold a part of this story. And I think it's in verse 24. Uh, chapter 26. Chapter 26, verse 24. You're welcome. <laughs> and as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus, and with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning has driven you out of your mind. But Paul says, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things and to him I speak boldly for I am persuaded that none of those things has escaped his notice and for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul in a short time would you persuade me between, um, to be a Christian. And if you were to read the King James, I prefer the King James, and what, almost thou persuadest me you become a Christian. Almost saved. Almost. But, Agrippa, you believe in the prophets? You believe in the Old Testaments? The, the Old Testament? Yeah. What's the but for Agri Agrippa? Now, I wonder what the reasoning process that Agrippa had that you know the prophets, you believe the prophets. And he could say, if John 3.16 was around at that time, I believe. Agrippa could say, I believe. But was that enough? What was his reasoning process to say, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian? Well, if I became a Christian, how would that change my life? It would change the things that I'll see, watch, do, believe. It would change my position. How would he reconcile all of that? Oh, well, it doesn't really matter, does it? It'll be okay. I still believe. And, and so he would ameliorate his mind. He would, he would be fearful of losing his status, losing credibility. Oh, you're one of those Christians now, are you? You've got to be mad. Paul, you're out of your mind, are you not? You've lost your marbles. No, Paul says, I haven't. But there was a conviction. The word is sharper than a two-edged sword. And it was piercing Herod Agrippa. And that conviction came over him. He says, almost you persuaded me to become a Christian. Almost. But he reviled from it. 
and he stood back and he said, no. Nah. Almost there, but not quite. But there was that reasoning process along that narrow road that enabled him to hop off but still think that I'm okay. That is the danger for one who is almost a Christian because they find a way to hop off the narrow road, still say I'm okay, and there's that reasoning process. What happens in our minds when we say, no, you're getting a bit over the top here, you're making a big thing out of a little thing. Let's have a look at, here's your well-worn path here. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 19. Just bear with me on this one. Resist the temptation, go, I've heard this story before. I know. But anyway, in Matthew chapter 19, and we'll, we'll just pick up on a, on a little bit of the story here. And you know the story quite well as the rich young ruler. But for the rich young ruler who was desperate for, to know about the, the, the gift of eternal life, absolutely desperate. So desperate that he was willing to run, pull up his robe, and to kneel before him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Kept the commandments? Yes, I've kept the commandments. Yes, yes, I've done all that. And so Jesus says to him here in uh, chapter 19 and verse 21, Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and follow me. Well, could you imagine the crowd that was around there at that point, what they would be thinking? Just imagine what they were thinking. You could sell some to me. I wouldn't mind a little bit of it. And I could imagine someone saying, don't do it. Don't be a fool. And so here's the rich young ruler in his mind trying to reconcile what must I do to inherit eternal life. Now he's on the narrow road. He's, he's making a good start on this narrow road by coming to Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Have you committed the commandments? Yes, I'm running this race now and I'm flat out, I'm sprinting. But you need to sell, if you want to be perfect, go and sell everything that you have. And phew, the race just stops there. And he falls before the finish line. But as he falls before that finish line, what stumbles him? How can I get out of this? How can I get out of this? How can I reconcile with the word that is sharper than a two-edged sword that is convicting me, he's got to the very nub of the thing that's preventing me continuing in to finish this race. Go and sell everything you have. And he had the wealth as his little G God. How do I get out of this? So there's a reasoning process. His mind's in flux here. And he's trying to reconcile his mind being in flux and to say that it's okay to leave. Yes, he left sad, but somehow he had to reconcile. Well, it's not culturally appropriate for me to go and sell all, that, uh, all I have. I will be poor. What am I supposed to live on? I, that's an unreasonable request. What about my status? For I am a young Pharisee. I'll lose my position. Can't do that. All these things probably went through his mind. This will be too humiliating for me. Fast forward to our world. As we run the race, what are some things that pull us off? For some, we may just crawl over the line 
dive over the line. You might have, for Catherine Schweitzer, someone who tries to pull you out of the race and so that you can't finish it. Or you like the poor old New Zealander who just collapses just before the finish line. Well, and Zephaniah says this, and this was in troublous times in Zephaniah, it will come about at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and I'll punish the men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good or evil. What Zephaniah is saying here, God's way over there, I'll just pick up and carry on with my own life. That is one thing that will pull us away. But there are other factors that are happening in this world that I just want to share with you just very quickly. So yes, we have the word, but... And this is the huge but for us. And this is Mark says, saying this, the society of the spectacle, and he's just making an evaluation of the world in which we live in, the society of the spectacle describes a highly visual culture. This is the world that we live in, is a highly visual culture in which its citizens have been reduced to consumers and spectators in which we were offered a never-ending parade of spectacular media events which constantly distracted us from morality, pain, and what it is to be human. In the society of the spectacle, politics has turned into theatre, sex into pornography, religion into consumerism. What he means by consumerism is that we just surf the net to find the best sermon around. In the society of the spectacle, reality TV sits next to the terrorist attack, broadcast endlessly on 24-hour news cycle, intermittently interrupted by ads for the latest teeth whitening product. That's the world that we are immersed in, in the trivial, the spectacle. That, that's our world. Mark Sayers goes on to say this, that the society of the spectacle creates this, listen to this, creates passivity among the citizens, a reluctance to initiate, to lead, instead we are encouraged to view and to consume. We fear committing, worrying, that by doing so we will reduce our freedom, cut ourselves off from the myriad of choices that constantly entices us. This is the world in which we live in. This is the world that tries to take us off the narrow road. The spectacle creates passivity. I am okay, but we live in a, but we become passive. We reluctant to um, hop out of our pews to lead. Oh, couldn't possibly do that, you know. And uh, we find some other reason not to do things. And so we continue to consume. We fear committing. And we love our freedom. Freedom is very precious to us. The society of the spectacle creates passivity amongst its citizens, reluctant to initiate, to lead. Instead, we're encouraged to view, to consume. And the neglected seedlings, and this comes from David Kidderman, and this is a book called Faith for Exiles. And I shared with this uh, about a month ago with you. But I believe that it has something very important for us. Deep spiritual longings, which ought to be lovingly tended and skillfully cultivated, are choked to death by binge television, immersive gaming, social media scrolling. As we say many times in the coming pages, technology and the lighted rectangles, we gaze at all the time, it ain't bad, in and of themselves, but if we're not vigilant and intentional, digital Babylon glitzes and blitzes our days so completely that never we never get around pursuing the deeper things of life. And I, I think his phrase of binge television, immersive gaming, 
are, are things that so easily ensnare us, that entice us over, um, off that narrow road. And so what is the result of that? Kinnaman goes on to say this, that a congregation may be physically present within their church, but their primary influence comes from the digital networks to which they are connected. Imagine a world without the Bible. That's how it was in the Middle Ages. Imagine the 21st century without a Bible. As I ponder that, it's not that hard to imagine. Do you know why? Because based on these quotes from Kinnaman and, and with immersive gaming, the digital world in which we live in entices us away from scripture. The world in which we live in pushes scripture out of our life that it is so hard for us to come to open up the Bible because it is not nearly as stimulating as watching TV, gaming, YouTube, whatever. And so people will defer to that. Revelation picturizes the last days where smoke obscures the sun. The sun comes through scripture whereby it, through the word whereby it convicts us, leads us, guides us, builds a scaffold around our belief structure, keeps us on the path. Smoke obscures the sun. Revelation 12, it talks about the sun, smoke obscuring. How is the devil obscuring scripture in your life as you walk with him? It's hard in this world, in this consumerist world, to engage with scripture. But each morning, we've got to come aside and say, I am not too busy, I am not over scheduled, scheduled enough to sit down and engage with scripture, to read and to ask God and to ask his spirit to touch our hearts. Teach me, Lord. What do you want me to learn today? How do you want me to respond? Read scripture. In 1984, Ronald Reagan, and this is a illustrates how times have changed. And times have changed enormously. And Ronald Reagan, as only Ronald Reagan could have done, got up in the press club and he shared a story that came from 404 AD, January 1. And the bloke was name was Timalchus. And this was when the gladiatorial games were still continuing. They had tried on a few occasions to stop these games, to stop the cruelty of these games. And Timalchus, as Ronald Reagan describes him, who was a small, slight man who weaved his way through underneath the alleyways to come out into the arena, and he would have seen tens of thousands of people standing around there. And he looks up at Caesar and he points up to him and he says to him, Stop doing this! Stop it in the name of Christ! And when he said that, a spear went straight through him. And he died right there. But that was the last time they had the games because... The people looked on, stunned. Stunned. I want you to say to you, say, stop. Stop what you're doing. Stop with all this busyness. 
Stop with the overscheduling. Monitor your social media. Otherwise, we, we just become imbeciles. Mindless people, consumers, engage with the word. It's still a living two-edged sword. It still pierces the heart. It still convicts us and it leads us and it helps us to stay on that path. Ask God to lead me on that path. Continue to lead me. Point out anything that offends you, Lord, as the psalmist would say. And ask him to say, what do I need to let go in order to stay on that path? Stop what we are doing. Ask God to help us and to lead us on the right path.